The Absolute at Large by Karel Chopik Translated by David Wiley Performed by Francis Bass Chapter 13 The Chronicler Apologizes Now please allow the Chronicler of the Absolute to draw attention to the difficulty of his situation. He has just written Chapter 13, and is aware that this unhappy number will have a decisive influence on the clarity and fullness of his account. There will be something in this baneful chapter which will cause confusion, of this you can be sure. The author could have written, as if it didn't matter, Chapter 14, but the attentive reader would then feel himself cheated of Chapter 13, and with good reason. He has, after all, paid his money and can expect to receive the account in full. But if you are afraid of the number 13, you should skip this chapter. To be honest, you won't lose much of the light shed on the gloomy matter of the absolute at large. And this is not the worst to cause embarrassment for the chronicler. He has already outlined to you, as coherently as he can, how the initial factory was created and how it flourished. He has drawn your attention to the effects of a number of carburetors, such as Mr. McCott's, the one in Givno, in the textile works in Upitsa, on Kazinda's dredger, and in Bender's roundabout. He has described the tragic case of Blahosh caused by the Absolute's ability to flow freely and infect people at long distance after, as we have seen, it had begun to spread inexorably, albeit without any perceptible plan. But now consider this horrifying fact. Since this whole affair began, a thousand different carburetors of many different types have been made. Trains, aeroplanes, cars, and ships powered by this most inexpensive of motors have been leaving whole clouds of the Absolute in their wake, in just the same way as they used to leave clouds of dust, smoke, and stench. Consider that thousands of factories all around the world have already thrown out their old boilers and converted to carburetor power. That hundreds of ministries and offices, hotels and barracks, schools and theaters and workers' hostels, Thousands of editorial offices and clubhouses, cabarets and homes were all being centrally heated with the latest MEAS carburetor. Consider that MEAS was absorbing other companies and that Ford, in America, threw itself into mass production of carburetors, spewing 30,000 new carburetors into the world every day. Yes, consider all this, and consider what effect the carburetor has had on anyone you've been told about so far. Multiply these effects by 100,000 and you will quickly understand what sort of problem the chronicler is faced with. He would love to come with you and wander round to each new carburetor as it appears, watch as it is placed on a wagon, given some hay, a piece of bread, or a cube of sugar to the massive horses with their majestic broad backs as they pull the rattling cart to the factory with a new copper cylinder. How he would love to stand with his arms on his hips and help to install each one, giving the workman his advice, and staying long enough to see each one begin to turn. Then how keen he would be to watch people's faces as it begins to take effect, as the Absolute enters them through the nose, through the ears, or whatever, as it dismantles the hardness of their natures, breaks their inclinations, heals their moral wounds, how it plows deep into their character and turns their earth, as it lights them up, grinds them down, changes what they are. How the world of miracles opens up before them, astonishing but so natural to mankind, the world of ecstasy, inspiration, holiness, and faith, as please believe the chronicler when he tells you that describing these events is beyond him. A historian will make use of a compendium of his knowledge of events, heuristics, diplomacy, abstractions, syntheses, statistics, and other techniques of his discipline all in conjunction. He will compress thousands and hundreds of thousands of detailed, live, personal events into a dense material to be shaped in whatever way might appeal to him. Then, he will take the result and call it historical fact, social evidence, cumulative events, development, cultural flow, or even historical truth. All the chronicler can do is look at individual events, but, after all, this is what a chronicler likes doing. Now let us suppose he ought to be pragmatic, create and develop ideas, describe things synthetically, and offer an explanation for the flow of religion that shook the world in the late 1940s. Aware of the enormity of his task, he will proceed to collecting and compiling the religious manifestations of that period. But on this heuristic route he might find, for instance, Jan Binder, emeritus variety performer in his stripy t-shirt, traveling from village to village with his atomic roundabout. Because of historical synthesis, the chronicler will clearly be prevented from taking the stripy t-shirt and the roundabout and even Jan Binder himself and drawing any inferences from them. He will be obliged to keep to the historical kernel. And assert no more than that, from its earliest stages, the religious phenomenon took all levels of society. Here the chronicler really ought to admit that he cannot tear himself away from Jan Bender. He is enchanted by his roundabout and even finds Bender's stripy t-shirt much more interesting than any synthetic feature. 
This is simply scientific incompetence, you might say, sheer dilettantism, too narrow a historic perspective, or anything else you might think of. But if the chronicler were at liberty to indulge his own inclinations, he would take up with Jan Bender, travel on with him down to Cheske Bujeovice and on to Klatovi, Pilsen, Zlitice, and so on. It is only with regret that he can take his leave of him in Stakovice, giving him a farewell wave. Goodbye, Mr. Bender. You're a nice man. Goodbye, roundabout. We won't be seeing each other again. God help me, I even left Kazinda and Breek on their dredger on the Voltava. I'd like to have spent many more evenings there with them, as I like the river Voltava, in fact, water courses of any sort, and evenings by the water are especially nice, and I've become very fond of Mr. Kazinda and Mr. Breek. As for Mr. Hudetz, the baker, the postman, the gamekeeper, and the lovers from Stikovice, I think even they would be worth closer attention, just like anyone, any one of you or any living person. But instead I have to hurry on and hardly even have the time to wave them goodbye with my hat. Goodbye, Mr. Kazinda. Good night, Mr. Breek. Thank you for that one night we spent on the dredger. And Dr. Blahosh, I even have to take my leave of you, too. I would love to spend many years with you and describe the whole of your life. After all, is the life of a private tutor not in its own way rich and exciting? Pass my greetings to your housekeeper, at least. Everything that is is worth observing. And that's why I'd like to go along with every new carburetor on its way. I would meet, and you would meet with me, many new people, and that's always worth doing, just to get a glimpse of their lives, see a tiny part of what's in their hearts, watch as their personal faith is born, and see their personal salvation. Linger by each new miracle when someone becomes holy, that would be an experience for me. Think of the beggar, the big businessman, the bank manager, the engine driver, warehouse man, rabbi, major business manager, cabaret comedian, any sort of human occupation you can think of. Think of the miser, the lecher, the snob, the skeptic, the sycophant, the careerist, and any sort of human character. Now think of the various, endlessly different, peculiar, and surprising cases where the grace of God has been shown, or, if you insist, cases of poisoning by the absolute, and how difficult it would be to take an interest in every one of them. Think of the degrees of faith, ranging from the simple believer to the fanatic, from the penitent to the miracle worker, from the convert to the fervent apostle. To cover all of this, put my hand to all of it, it would be in vain. This work would never be finished. There would be so much historical material that the chronicler would be forced to relinquish the honor of making a scientific distillation of it all. In a state of anguish, he would be forced to turn away from cases which he is not required to report on. I wish I could stay with the blessed Ellen. I wish I were not forced to abandon R. Mark, who is undergoing treatment in a spa town for his shattered nerves. I wish I could uncover Mr. Bondy's industrial strategy in the workings of his mind. But I have no choice in the matter. The absolute has now inundated the world and become a mass phenomenon. The chronicler can only look back with regret and devote himself to giving a summary outline of some of the social and political events which inexorably took place. So, let us embark on the examination of a new set of facts. Chapter 14 Land of Plenty The chronicler, and certainly many of yourselves too, has often looked up at the stars in the night sky for whatever reason and become aware, in dumb amazement, of their enormous number and inconceivable size and distance, and reminded himself that each of those points is an immense world of fire or even an entire living solar system, and that these points could number in the billions. Or, when he has looked down from a high mountain, it happens to me in the Tatras Mountains in Slovakia, at the wide spread of meadows and woods and hills, and close in front of him the dense forest and grassland, everything in abundance, tangled, vigorous, and astonishingly full of life. When he saw how the grass was thick with flowers and beetles and butterflies, and this dizzying abundance was repeated all over the panorama, spread out before him to God knows where, and this panorama was like countless other panoramas all over the world, just as full and bountiful, covering the surface of our entire planet. When the chronicler has been faced with a spectacle such as this, he has often thought of the Creator, and said to himself, if there was someone who made or created all this, then, to put it plainly, it was a work of amazing, wasteful extravagance. If anyone was to demonstrate his right to call himself the creator, there was no need to create in such insane quantities. Abundance is chaos, and chaos is something like drunkenness or insanity. Yes, the human mind is offended at the superfluity of creation. There is simply too much of it, an insane boundlessness. Anyone who's been eternal since birth will have become used to all these large scales, of course, 
and won't have the right measure, as all measures will be based on infinity. Or, more likely, he won't have any measure at all. Please don't suppose I'm committing blasphemy. I'm simply trying to express the disproportion between human understanding and cosmic abundance. This pointless, abundant, fanatical excess of everything that exists. Looked at with a sober eye, it seems more like an unleashing than any conscious or methodical creation. I just thought I'd better say that, for the sake of decency, before we go back to the subject at hand. You will be already aware that the perfect burning invented by Mark all but proved the existence of the absolute in all matter. It can be imagined thus. This is, of course, all hypothetical. Before the creation, all that existed was the absolute as limitless free energy. This free energy, for some important physical or moral reason, started to create. It was transformed into working energy, and, precisely in accordance with the laws of inversion, it was changed into a state of infinite bound energy. In this way, it lost some of its power of work to create matter, in which it remained caged in latent form. And if that's hard to understand, there is nothing I can do about it. So, it seems that burning material in Mark's atomic motor would release this energy from the bounds that held it. It became free energy, or the active absolute, just as it had been before the creation. It was a sudden liberation of the inscrutable working power that had already been seen at the creation of the world. If the whole of the universe were suddenly and perfectly burned, it would become possible to reproduce the primeval act of creation. It would certainly be the end of the world, a perfect liquidation that would make it possible to found a new world order, Cosmos II. But, as you know, Mark's carburetor was still only able to burn matter one kilo at a time. The Absolute, released in this way little by little, either did not feel strong enough to start a new creation straight away, or maybe did not want to repeat what it had already done. In short, it somehow decided to manifest itself in two different ways, one that was somewhat traditional, and the other was decidedly modern. The traditional way in which it made itself felt was, as you know, religious. It was the cause of various inspirations and conversions, moral effects and miracles, levitation, ecstasy, prophecies, and, above all, religious faith. Here, the Absolute broke into the personal and cultural life of mankind in ways that were already well-trodden, albeit to an extent unprecedented. After a few months, there was hardly anyone on earth who had not been smitten with religion for at least a short time, whose soul the Absolute had not laid claim to. We will return to this psychological manifestation of the Absolute later, once it becomes necessary to describe its catastrophic consequences. The other way the Free Absolute showed its existence brought something entirely new. The boundless energy which had once been occupied with the creation of the world threw itself, clearly with disregard to the changed circumstances, into industry. It did not create, it manufactured. Instead of pure creation, it set to work at machines and made itself the infinite workman. Consider that every factory in the world, a factory making nails, for instance, had by this time replaced its steam engines with a perfect carburetor as the cheapest source of energy. The Absolute was continuously emerging from these atomic motors, and with its innate intelligence glanced, as it were, at means of production by day, and then, perhaps because of its unstoppable urge to create, or perhaps because of ambition, threw itself into production. It began making nails on its own initiative. Once it had started, there was no stopping it. The machine, with nobody there to operate it, spewed out nails and ever larger quantities of iron were supplied for making them. At first sight, it was horrifying. When materials were used up, iron surged up to replace them. The ground around the factory sweated pure iron, as if sucked up from the depths of the earth. Then the iron rose about a meter in the air and glid rapidly into the machines, as if something had shoved it there. Do be careful here. I use the phrase, the iron rose, and glid, but all the eyewitnesses say they got the impression that the iron was lifted by an invisible but irresistible force, something with such an obvious concentration of power that it made you shudder. There was clearly some mighty horror doing it all. Yes, some of you may have played around with spiritualism and seen the table rise. I have been assured that the table does not rise with the ease of something immaterial, but with a kind of jerky effort. It bursts from all its bonds, shudders, is forced up by degrees until it is thrown into the air as if struggling against some kind of force. But how am I to describe this horrible, mute struggle whereby iron is lifted from the depths of the earth, beaten into rods, and inserted into the machines that will chop them into nails? The rods coil round like whips, rattle and scrape in their efforts to resist the silent, immaterial force that moves them. Every account given at the time describes the horror felt at this sight. It's true that it was a miracle, but don't imagine that a miracle must be something light and easy like in a fairy tale. 
It seems, rather, that a real miracle is based on something startling, innervating, tense. But whatever effort the Absolute had to apply to this work, it was overshadowed by the sheer, astonishing quantity produced. The number of nails produced by one factory, as that is the branch of industry we are talking about at present, was enough to create whole mountains of them in the yard. They were churned out day and night so that mountains would rise beyond the factory yards and fill the streets around it. Let us stay on the subject of nails, as the manufacture of nails shows the wasteful but inexhaustible nature of the absolute, just as it was at the creation of the world. Once it had thrown itself into production, it showed no concern for distribution, demand, market, purpose, no concern for anything whatsoever. All of its tremendous energy was devoted simply to spewing out nails. It was, at its heart, eternal, and had no concept of adequacy or limits in anything, not even nails. Try to imagine the astonishment of the workers in nail factories such as this when they saw the production levels after the new engine had been installed. For them, it was unexpected and unfair competition, something that would render their own labor superfluous. It was Manchester capitalism mounting an attack on the working man, and they would have good reason to set themselves in opposition to it. They would at least have been justified in demolishing the factory and hanging its owners had they not been taken by surprise and overcome by the absolute, so that every form of religious enlightenment appeared among them. Instead of unrest, they manifested levitation, prophesying, miracle working, clairvoyance, healing of the sick, holiness, love for their neighbors, and other such unnatural acts and wonders. On the other hand, you might well imagine how the factory owners viewed this God given mass manufacture. You might well think they would celebrate, sack all the workers who already annoyed them half to death anyway, and rub their hands with glee at the heaps of nails which had not cost them a penny to produce. But they too were subject to the mental effects of the absolute and immediately made the entire factory over to the workers, their brothers in God, to form an industrial cooperative. It was not long, though, before they realized these heaps of nails were totally worthless because there was no way of getting rid of them. It was true that the workers would no longer have to stand at the machines with rods of iron in their hands and that they were now co owners of the works, but within a few days it became obvious they would need to find some way of removing the hundreds of tons of nails which, by now, could no longer be seen as goods. First, they tried sending wagon loads of nails to false addresses. Then, all they could do was dump them in enormous heaps outside the town. Removing the nails in this way kept all the workers occupied for fourteen hours a day, but they made no complaint as they had been enlightened with the Spirit of God in service to their neighbors. Forgive me for having spent so much time on the subject of nails. The Absolute did not specialize in any one branch of industry. It threw itself with the same vigor into manufacture of textiles, where it performed a miracle not only by weaving rope out of sand, but even fine thread. The machines for spinning and weaving and knitting threw out millions of kilometers of all kinds of textiles and did so without stopping, causing upheaval in the whole of the industry. It took control of the ironworks, the foundries, the engineering works, the factories making machinery, the sawmills, the timber works, rubber works, sugar producers, chemical industries, fertilizer industries, nitrate works, printers, paper works, dye works, glass works, ceramic works, shoemakers, weavers, all the kilns, all the mines, all the breweries, distilleries, and dairies. The mills were taken over, the mints were taken over, the car works were taken over, and the grinding shops were taken over. It span, it knitted, it wove, it smelted, it hammered, it assembled, it sewed, it planed, it sawed, it soldered, it pressed, it bleached, it refined, it cooked, it filtered, it printed through all the 24 hours of the day, and sometimes 26. Where it took the place of tractors, it plowed, it sowed, it harrowed, it weeded, it reaped, it harvested, and it threshed. Wherever the absolute was put to use, it obtained ten times more material and made a hundred times more products than before. It was inexhaustible, it was a volcano of productivity. Its boundlessness was expressed as abundance. The miraculous feeding of the five thousand with a few loaves and fishes was repeated over a monumental scale and became the miraculous supply of nails, boards, nitric fertilizers, tires, printing paper, and any and every other industrial product. The world entered a period of boundless plenty. Everything was there that mankind needed, except that boundless plenty was just what mankind did not need. Chapter 15 Upheaval In the well ordered times, I might even say blessed times, we now live in, when everything has its proper price, it's impossible for us to imagine what a social evil unbounded plenty could represent. We suppose it would be nothing less than paradise, heaven on earth, if everything were suddenly available in unlimited abundance. Wonderful, we would think, to have enough for everybody and everything so cheap. 
But in the time we are describing, when the absolute had begun to take a hand in industrial production, everything that anyone could possibly need was not just cheap but entirely free, and the result was an economic disaster. Not only could you take a handful of nails for nothing to bang into your floorboards, but you could take a whole wagon load of nails. But then tell me, what would you do with a whole wagon load? Would you transport them somewhere a hundred miles away to be distributed again for nothing? You would not do that because if you were standing on a whole mountain of nails, you would no longer see them as nails, that is, as something fairly useful, but as something entirely worthless and meaningless simply because of their abundance. They would be of no more use than the stars in the sky. There was indeed a time when a pile of shiny new nails was seen as something noble that would inspire the poet. Just like the stars, they seemed made simply for our mute admiration. The heaps of nails seemed, in their way, to be a part of the landscape, and they added to its beauty, just like the sea. But again, like the sea, they were not loaded onto wagons and transported inland where there was no sea. There is no commercial distribution of sea water, and now there was none for nails either. So while one place was inundated with a shining sea of nails, just a few miles away there were none to be found. They had no commercial value, and so they disappeared from the shops. If you needed a nail or two to fix the heel on your shoe or to play a trick on your neighbor, you would search for them in vain. There were no more nails than there is sea in Bohemia. Where are the merchants of yesteryear, the traders who bought the goods we need cheap and sold them dear? Alas, they have disappeared, for the grace of God has fallen upon them. They have become ashamed of their profits and closed their shops. Now they contemplate the brotherhood of man and give away their belongings. Now they never ever try to become rich by distributing the goods their brothers need. Where there is no price, there is no market. Where there is no market, there is no distribution. Where there is no distribution, there are no goods. And where there are no goods, there is poverty. Prices rise, profits rise, share prices rise. But the businessmen have turned away from the profit motive in disgust, an insuperable aversion to money and the counting of it. They stopped seeing the world in terms of consumption, markets, and turnover. They put their hands together and admired the holiness and beauty of the world. And meanwhile, there were no more nails. No more nails, even though not very far away, there were mountains of them. And the bakers too. The bakers went out in front of their shops and called, "Come, good people, come with the love of Christ and take the loaves you need. Take flour, take cakes and pastries. Praise the Lord and take all for nothing." And the cloth merchants rolled bales of material straight out onto the street. With tears of joy, they cut off five or ten meters of cloth to give to each passerby, begging them to accept their little present. Only once their shops were quite empty did they fall on their knees and thank the Lord for giving them the task of dressing their neighbors like the lilies of the field. The butchers put baskets on their heads full of meat and sausages and cooked meat and carried them from door to door, urging each householder to take whatever she wanted. The sellers of shoes, furniture, tobacco, baggage, spectacles, jewelry, carpets, whips, ropes, hardware, porcelain, books, false teeth, vegetables, medicines. Whatever goods you can think of, all of them, inspired by the breath of God, rushed out onto the streets and distributed all they had in the noble ecstasy of the grace of God. When all their goods and possessions had been given away, they stood in the doorways of their empty shops and storerooms, and their eyes shining with joy, told each other, "Well, brother, that is a great weight off my conscience." After a few days of this, there was nothing more anywhere to be given away, and there was nothing more to be bought either. The absolute had plundered and emptied all the shops of everything. Meanwhile, far from the cities, millions of tons of cloth was churning out from the looms, Niagaras of sugar cubes from the machines, a burgeoning and inexhaustible cornucopia of every kind of product created by God's overproduction. Any feeble attempt to distribute this flood of goods to where it could be used soon came to a halt. It simply couldn't be done. It's even possible that this economic disaster also caused something else: monetary inflation. The absolute, you see, had also taken over the national mints and printing works. Every day, hundreds of millions of banknotes and coins and letters of credit were churned out into the world, so that devaluation was a matter of course. Soon, a bundle of five thousand koro notes was nothing more than rather hard toilet paper. If you wanted to buy a child's lollipop, it was all the same. If you offered one koruna or half a million, you still wouldn't get your lollipop, as lollipops had disappeared. All the numbers used by accountants lost their meaning. The entire system of accountancy was overturned, which was, of course, no more than a natural consequence of divine boundlessness and omnipotence. About this time, shortages and even famines began to appear in the cities. Because of the reasons just outlined, the entire apparatus for the supply of goods had collapsed. The government ministries were still there: ministries of trade and industry, social security, transport, 
It would have been possible to gather the tremendous flow of products spewing out from the factories to prevent their decay and organize their distribution to the areas devastated by God's generosity. Unfortunately, though, this did not happen. Ministry staff spent all the time when they could have been working engrossed in prayer and raptured by a grace stronger than anything known before. The ministry of supply was controlled by one of the clerks, Miss Sharova, who preached about the seven stages. In the ministry of trade, the department manager, Mr. Winkler, devoted himself to an asceticism similar to Indian yoga. This mania, however, lasted only a fortnight before, as miraculously as it had disappeared, the staff regained their sense of duty. It must have been the absolute that reminded them of it. In the effort to resolve the catastrophe afflicting the distribution of goods, they worked feverishly by day and night, but it was clearly too late. The only result was that each ministry issued 15 to 53,000 documents every day, with an interministerial commission then ordered to be taken away in lorries and dumped in the river. Worst of all was the situation affecting food, but fortunately, at least as far as the Czech lands were concerned, we had our stout hearted farmers. Gentlemen, this is the time to remember that we have always honored our farm workers, the heart of the nation. There is even an ancient song in their praise Who is that man? What is he called? The farmer of Czech land who feeds us all. The fever of waste and squandering caused by the absolute did not come near him. Who is that man? He stood firm while the markets of the world fell into panic. Who is that man? He did not fold his hands in his lap, did not succumb to alarm and panic. He remained faithful to his calling. Who is that man? What is he called? The farmer of Czechland, who feeds us all. Yes, it was the farmers, here and elsewhere, who in their way saved the world from starvation. Imagine if they had been struck with the mania of giving all they had away to the poor and needy, like the people in the cities. If they had given all their grain away, their cattle and their calves, their chickens and their geese and their potatoes. Within two weeks the cities would have been hungry and the country would have been emptied, sucked dry, without any supplies and itself facing starvation. Thanks to our jolly farmers, this did not need to happen. In retrospect, we might try to explain this miracle in terms of the farm workers' instincts. Or we might talk about their faithful, pure, and deeply grounded tradition. Or we might merely try to explain it by pointing out that carburetors were not used in the same enormous numbers in small farms as they were in industry. In short, however you want to explain it, the absolute was less virulent in the countryside, and the farmers were not taken over by it. The farms did not suffer the same general economic and commercial collapse as happened in the cities. The farmers did not give away a single piece of straw or a single grain of oats. The old commercial and industrial order was in ruins, but the farmers remained calm and unperturbed and sold what they had. And they sold it dear. They had some secret instinct that let them foresee what disasters would be caused by overabundance. And they slowed production in time. They slowed production so that prices would rise however full their granaries were. This is an indication of the amazing good sense at the heart of our country folk. Without a word, without organization, led to salvation by nothing more than their inner voice, and wherever they were, they put up the prices. Because everything had become so dear, nothing was wasted. In the middle of insane abundance of everything, there was an enclave of scarcity and high prices. There is no doubt they somehow knew that in this way they were saving the world. Goods that had been given away for nothing quickly lost their value, as they had to as natural consequence of their being available for free, and disappeared from the market, but the buying and selling of foodstuffs continued. You did, of course, have to travel out to the country to get it. Your local butcher and baker and grocer had nothing more to give you than his brotherly love and the word of the Lord, so you put on your rucksack and went out a hundred and twenty kilometers from farm to farm, and finally you would be able to buy a kilo of potatoes in return for a gold watch, or an egg for a pair of binoculars, or a kilo of bran for an accordion or a typewriter. And there was food to eat. Do understand, if each farmer had given it all away, you would soon have perished, but he took a pound of butter and put it to one side for you, waiting for you to arrive and give him a Persian carpet for it, or a rare and costly folk costume. So tell me, who was it who stopped the insane communist experiments of the absolute from going too far? Who was it who did not lose his head in a pandemonium of virtue? Who resisted the disastrous flood of plenty and, with no thought for our lives or property, saved us from destruction? Who is that man? What is he called? The farmer of Czechland, who feeds us all. This recording is under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Music was composed by John Philip Sousa and performed by the United States Marine Band. The book was written by Karel Chopek, translated by David Wiley, and performed by Francis Bass.